Welcome to another exciting lecture. Today we'll be discussing on vented honeycomb sandwich structures. It's an application that comes up a lot in spacecraft, launch vehicles, and aircraft applications. And I'll be going into that subject. Uh, here's a number of papers and presentations I recommend you look at. I have a uh, AIWA conference paper. I have another AIWA conference, a American Society of Composites paper you can download. There's also a, a, a presentation that was provided uh, that you can find as well. And then there's a lot of additional content you can find through online sources from FAA, Airbus, Boeing, and so forth on this particular topic. So what is, what is, what is a honeycomb structure? A honeycomb structure uh, is part of a composite structure. And the honeycomb core goes between two layers of face sheets, composites. And the purpose of the honeycomb core is to provide additional bending stiffness to the structure. So by making the thickness greater of the overall composite structure, you're increasing the moment of inertia. And as a consequence, you're increasing the bending stiffness. But you don't wanna increase the composite structure thickness by putting a lot of heavy material. Instead, you can put something weak in between, closer to air, not air, but something between that can uh, serve the purpose of increasing that thickness and providing the extra bending stiffness that you will need for many of these aircraft applications, aerospace applications. So when is honeycomb core considered unvented? That's a scenario where the air is trapped inside the honeycomb cell and is not allowed to escape. So you have air inside the honeycomb cell so that the core that's in between the two phase sheets is made of honeycomb architecture. And you could have air trapped in there that's not allowed to escape. Uh, you can also have the situation of encapsulated air within the honeycomb structure. That air that's stuck in between the phase sheets can generate a differential pressure. So say that the air outside and the air inside the core is the same, the, 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 the pressure outside the core, outside of the phase sheet is the same as the pressure inside the core. As the aircraft ascends, the air inside will maintain the same pressure because it's, it's entrapped. But the air outside, that pressure is dropping because as you ascend, the density of air decreases, the pressure decreases. As a consequence, you're gonna have a pressure differential across the phase sheet. And so we have to then understand what is going on there. And there's historically two fitter scenarios associated with pressure that stays in the internal cavity. And the two uh, fitter scenarios are that you could have a face sheet to core weak bond line. So the bond line between is very weak. The second one is that the face sheet could have some sort of separation to start with. And that initial delamination that you have between the face sheet and the core, when pressurized can cause a bubble, which can then propagate to failure if, if you have that scenario. If you have a, comp a compression load in addition to the pressure inside the core, that can make the situation even worse. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. So you have here a scenario of a air and trap. If you were to have a face sheet disbond, then this face sheet will pop out like this and the air will push the face sheet out. That can cause either the face sheet to pop out or, or fail or the face sheet to core uh, bond line to propagate, that delamination to propagate. If you have a scenario where the air can escape, like you can see here, um, then you don't have that pressure differential. And so what are the issues that you could encounter with the left-hand side. During rapid ascent, an unvented core scenario will develop significant pressure due to trapped air. This delta P across the phase sheet can increase and go beyond 20 PSI. Why? Because if you say you take a rocket situation, the air that's entrapped could be at room temperature pressure 14.7 PSI. As you ascend, it's possible that the skin of the space launch vehicle will get hot and that hot temperature will then cause the air to get hot, which means the pressure will increase because increasing 
air temperature also increases the air pressure by the, by the ideal gas law. As a consequence, that differential pressure can be even greater than you would have expected. Pressure load may result in partial failure of that phase sheet or delamination growth. So what are the issues with the one on the right? One possibility is that you create a vent size holes that are such that you can't get the air to escape quickly. And in that scenario, you can still get the situation on the left, even though you have an escape for air. So that's one possibility. Uh, you could also have issues with corrosion. So because now you have a path to the outside, you could have the scenario where moisture ingression can start getting some issues uh, of corrosion inside. So what, what is the failure mode that everybody's concerned about when it comes to unvented honeycomb core is really the quality of this phase sheet bond line here. Manufacturing quality issues can affect bond line strength, which may not be detected by inspection for flaws. And what are those issues that you can see typically in bond lines? You can see aging of the adhesive, poor surface preparation, contamination, cure cycle problems, uniformity of cure pressure, improper dry fit, and storage condition issues. Quality escapes can also be an issue, and they're not uncommon in composites. We know it can happen all the time. So say you have contamination. Uh, maybe somebody dropped a chip of paint here, and now you have uh, initial delamination. Uh, contamination can be an issue, and they, that might not be very easy to detect through inspection of processing parameters. And so you have to pay attention to that when you're dealing with unvented honeycomb structures, because now I have an additional loading configuration that was not present in the vented configuration. So there are many examples. Um, we have aviation examples where partial, you have part of the aircraft coming apart. Uh, there's a tail of a rudder. And we have many scenarios like this showing up very often. This was caused by unvented honeycomb configuration. And that's why the aviation industry is very interested in this problem. And that's one reason I'm also explaining it here because it has been an issue of concern that shows up sporadically. You have marine structures also because of moisture ingression can also cause extra pressure that then causes the failure events. As an example, we have the Atlas Able Venting Fader in 1959. And in 1959, during launch, the nose fairing here began breaking up. And it, it happened because you have these aerodynamic forces and the issue found that there is no way to measure uh, and to compensate for the pressure differential across the phase sheet. And so that caused a three meter fiberglass shroud to fail because there's no way to mitigate this failure, uh, failure of concern. The Mariner 3 fairing failure, and you can see the, the NASA Lesson Learn database 356 in this website, records that Mariner 3 was built by JPO and it was for observations and open our orbit insertion, the encasing of the spacecraft failed to open properly. And when they looked at it carefully, it had to do with the fact that you could have a unvented honeycomb or, or venting, uh, unvented fader scenario again. Uh, and so that's another issue that was found that merits some attention. We also have the Apollo 6 flight failure, 1968. And in that scenario, you had a situation where it was vented, but now, so it was more like the one on the right, schematically speaking. Um, so now that's a scenario where, where vented was an issue. And why was it an issue? Because water ingressed, it, it, it got in, and the air, the, the, the entrapped moisture in there, in the honeycomb cells that were perforated became heated during boost. And so now that, became boiled um, and the pressure increased inside until the fish is blew out. So that's another example of where you could have an issue. And contradictory examples, right? 
the X-33 tank failure also was due to a, a, a honeycomb issue uh, that, that involved uh, venting. So what happened there, the, the tank outer skin and core rapidly separated from the skin 15 minutes after the LH2 drained. And there was a clean bond line failure uh, due to manufacturing defect in the area of concern. So what was the lesson learned in that program is that you have to check out the scaling of the manufacturing processes to make sure that your processes at the small scale level can translate to a bigger scale level. That the, if you have adhesive out time, many people think, well, you know, it's been out for very few time, but if it's, if you expired the material due to out time, not expired, but if the adhesive out time was exceeded, you may want to look at that because that also implies loss of strength. And that micro cracking can be an issue for uh, tanks um, in composites. And that venting issues can be a concern and that they should be addressed and looked at carefully. You also have an ISS radiator panel fader 2009. You can see here the National Lesson Learned Database 356. Again, pressure buildup continued over time until the face sheet came out and it propagated between the face sheet and the core. And so again, something to be considered when you're developing designs and be mindful of understanding the quality of the face sheet to honeycomb, but understanding the limits of your design, whether on vented and vented, is of extreme importance. The space system overall uh, experienced several satellite failures, 2004, 2011, 2012, and this is all in the news articles. But again, you had the situation here where the solar arrays had, were unable to correctly, correctly vent the air. And as the rockets transverse the atmosphere, it again formed a pressure differential. And all three of them failed uh, and cost the program millions of dollars. This issue has been looked at by the composite uh, in the NASA composite crew module, a lot of investigations going on to really come up with designs that are robust uh, and incorporating periodic inspections, incorporating um, NDI and doing analysis and testing to understand the limits of the design when you do have a core that can get pressurized. The orbiter had also an invented sandwich structure, but they did a lot of work to understand the proof, the acceptance testing, the proof testing and inspections. And here's an example of the orbiter invented sandwich testing. They took uh, cores and they pressurized the core uh, with air and they, 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 they tried to determine what is, what is the capability of these panels on the pressure. There's more history of failures here. Um, so in 1964, we had a Mariner 3 mission failure and post-flight test of the honeycomb with vented holes subjected to pressure and temperature survived. Well, a high humidity one uh, led to failure even with a vented design. In 1966, the Titan 3 fiberglass phenolic honeycomb sandwich failure exploded. Uh, and again, investigation found that there is this pressure differential that was causing the issues and corrective actions were taken to improve the ND process and making sure that we have a good bond strength between the skin and the core. 1983, again, an invented core issue uh, that failed during thermal vacuum testing. 1987, an FS3 um, also had a blister-like separation um, that followed by rapid debunk growth. Uh, that fairing had that issue and it failed during a proof test trying to simulate the condition at 90,000 feet, which we will have experience in flight. So the proof test did a good job of capturing the vent. And if you don't know what proof test is, proof test is a loading condition that you apply to try to simulate a little bit higher than flight conditions and be able to achieve 
a stress state that's over stressing it to make sure you're good in terms of workmanship. And then the three space Laurel satellites I talked about, and then the Lockheed Martin X-33 failure. And then we have the aviation incidents, the rotor Airbus 310, 308, um, surface structural failures due to basically you had an initial flaw uh, and when you take off and land and take off and land, you're, you're basically applying pressure and cyclically applying pressure to that core that pushes the fish out. So any defect uh, basically starts growing over time. There's five cases of rudder failures for the Concord, and also there's uh, other, many other situations like this where this has been an issue. There's a number of references here that I recommend you download to, for further study in addition to the one in the second page of this uh, video lecture. So you feel free to pause it here and download this material and study so you can learn more about this. So you can be cognizant. The whole point of this particular lecture is so you be cognizant on how to design if, a structure if you're encountering this situation. And really it comes down, later I'll talk about it, but it comes down to having a good non-destructive evaluation, having a design that can capture uh, and, and mitigate this issue of pressure in the core. You cannot eliminate it completely, but if you can come up with a robust design, you may have a better chance. There's standards across industry uh, in, in many cases that have actually even prevented trying to have a honeycomb on vented design. In fact, SMC at one point required vented designs for spacecraft and launch vehicles. Um, and so this has been an area of contention. Can you, should you unvent it or vent it? You know, which one is the right way? And the answer is, you know, there's no perfect answer. If you look at AIAAS 110, which is another standard that governs structures, this one is not a standard. This is commander policy that's out of, out of, uh, it's no longer enforced. But this one is a, a standard that's used uh, by spacecraft and launch vehicle designs. And it talks about basically making sure that you vent the design. Uh, sandwich structures shall normally vent the design and the design shall utilize perforated core fitted with either perforated face sheets and or panel edge members that allow, ga allow gases present within the sandwich structure to vent safely during ascent into orbit. But the fact of the matter is that there might be situations that that's not possible. It may not be possible to vent the core. And so there are exceptions to the rule. And what they're saying here is that the structure shall sustain the pressure buildup without violating strength and stability requirements. In other words, if you were to have pressure inside the core, you have to make sure your structure can withstand that. And they're asking here for a specialized proof test to making sure you simulate the critical ascent environment as examples that we saw here for the Atlas V fairing, which was failed during a proof test, which shows the value of it, of course. And we want to make sure that you're make, making sure that the phase sheet core bound lines, those any D bonds found there are assessed appropriately. Now, this is one, one point of view. Another point of view is that you don't want to vent the core because if you were to vent the core, you have path to the outside and that path to the outside means that I will have moisture ingression uh, and I could start getting corrosion and other events. So in other words, it's extremely important to come up with a good balance of what makes sense for you. If you look at NASA standard 6016, here is trying to say that structural sandwich assemblies shall be designed to prevent the entrance and entrapment of air, of water vapor or other contaminants into, into the core structure, uh, which means that they, in this case, they probably want it unvented, not vented. Here, they want it vented. Here in this standard, they're talking about finding ways of not letting that water vapor to get in. Churchill honeycomb sandwich structures that will be subjected to heating shall use metallic or glass reinforced core to minimize absor absorption of moisture. Sandwich assemblies using perforated and moisture absorption core shall be protected from water intrusion during assemblies. And so th that shows clearly 
that they're looking at a, 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 a different way of looking at things. Uh, the, the vented constructions, uh, honeycomb core perforations can be um, specced out. Uh, and you have the mill C7438 and MS4175. They talk about the kinds of perforations you want to have, size and location, and also the MS4175 that talk about the size and location. And it talks about how adjacent basically how how close of each other the the, the, the perforations can be uh, and so forth other considerations uh, and this one you can find from uh, textbook here the bottom uh, non-metallic honeycomb cores cannot be perforated as they're dipped in resin and so it's possible that that resin will fill the perforation so if you have that situation then the resin can cover it up uh, but, and this can actually happen with aluminum, so you can have the bond uh, adhesive start to flow down and, and cover it up. There's other ways that people have gone about this that create a slots that allow the, the, the air to, to travel. Now, what you're seeing here is a single honeycomb cell, but think of this as hundreds of honeycomb cells interconnected. So vented constructions, uh, typically we want, we want to avoid moisture absorbing core materials. We want to ensure preclusion of moisture entrapment. I discussed that. We want to have a good honeycomb core perforation specification. We want to make sure that the venting architecture can relieve the internal pressure. Uh, so one approach is the open edge design, hole drills into the face sheet. We want to verify the S manufacturer application vents adequately. So you want to consider the environments, how fast it needs to vent out. We want to make sure the manufacturing processes do not plug holes. And we want to make sure we have testing analysis that validates the pressure decay. And that this is for vented constructions. For non-vented constructions, where the air can be entrapped. Uh, we want to avoid moisture absorb absorbing core materials. We want to consider pressure vessel loading environment in the design. And we want to do thermal cycling to see how this behaves. We want to make sure we have a good damage tolerance, core to face sheet, bond line fracture mechanics. We want to make sure we have combined loads considered in the assessment because you may have axial loading compression plus pressure inside and maybe the implementation of a proof test that's able to verify the bond lines. There are other types of venting architectures, a slitted core or needle perforated core. And the characterization of the sandwich structure should evaluate the core type and also should evaluate the core airflow rate. So those are very important considerations. Low ventilation leads to greater pressure buildup within the core. So venting, uh, this is a, an example of what a pressure decay testing is, but you're gonna have to fabricate an edge rail frame to protect the core edges. We wanna seal the specimen. We wanna make sure we vacuum the specimen. And then we wanna turn off the vacuum and record the leak rate. So what is Airbus perspective on this topic? Airbus is an aircraft manufacturer. Um, and the idea here is that when the air is trapped, fascias can rupture or separate due to poor quality between the core and the face sheet. Here you can see the face sheet, here you can see the core, this can separate. And when the air escapes through the honeycomb perforations to the exterior, the internal pressure can be relieved during ascent. So what is the perspective used there? You know, so I'm starting at ground level here. What is assumption is that the air volume enclosed, you have an air volume enclosed and that you may have an invented architecture and then you may have a D-bond, some delamination to start with. You go to space or to, to, to an altitude, flying altitude. And at that point in time, you can see a D-bond that forms where pressure pushes that face sheet out and then you come down to ground. So we call this the ground to air ground cycle, okay? So we call this ground to air to ground cycles and we wanna do testing to try to verify um, that if you were to have a D-bond, say in the rudder location, 
that it can take the cyclic loading very well. <coughs> and so you have ground to cycle pressurization. You could have in-plane loading as well that can make things worse. You can see here the D bonds popping out. And so we want to make sure that the structure can sustain this kind of loading, this cyclic loading. You can see here uh, Airbus vacuum chamber test trying to simulate the ground to air gra ground cycles. You can see how the fatigue started and it started to propagate non uniformly around there. And you can see here testing 2005 showing damage propagation uh, due to this issue. So, you know, continuing on with the Airbus perspective, there's a lot of aspects to this. Uh, we call this the Airbus circle of knowledge sandwich structures or sandwich structures. You have the sandwich rudder design, for example. You have aircraft that have failed, like in 2005. And you have the non destructive evaluation methods that have to be incorporated to make sure we can find these D bonds before they become catastrophic. You wanna, you wanna do analysis at the component level and testing at the coupon level to characterize these kinds of uh, bond lines if you were to have a D bond. And then you wanna be able to apply this data to a ground to air cycle test and learn more and then have analysis that can match the test. Why? Because that can be very useful in the design process. So we start with the unvented honeycomb structure. We wanna characterize the properties of the fascia to core and you wanna do that through fracture testing. So you wanna characterize that, that D bond, the fracture toughness between the face sheet and the core. And then you wanna determine what the critical energy release rate is, which is a material property. And the idea is to then perform some validation tests to make sure that you can actually predict failure properly in a small coupon. So basically you pressurize it and you cycle it to see if you can get it right. You wanna fully characterize the ascent and pressure environment. You wanna make sure you have the whole compression loading environment for the aircraft, spacecraft or launch vehicle. And with these loading conditions, you can then determine the critical flaw size that can cause failure using the virtual crack closure technique, which is a technique to predict failure in a composite structure. You can use that to determine the allowable flaw size. And then you wanna make sure that your design can be, is able to inspect for this allowable flaw size. You find the critical flaw size, you can put a factor of safety and call that the allowable flaw size. That allowable flaw size is a flaw size at which if you had a flaw that was greater than allowable flaw size, you will try to repair. If it was below, you probably don't have to do much, but if it's above, you wanna repair. And so this is a line that you draw in the sand. And what you wanna make sure is that your NDE can actually capture this appropriately. So coupon and subscale testing, you can have the single cantilever beam test. And then you wanna take this information and try to simulate the subscale test. That's the idea. Uh, the derivation of critical flaw size requires the determination of fracture properties through a test like this. And the single cantilever beam test has become one of the top tests for doing this. And there is, there is an STM standard on the development to do that, just that. Um, and so subscale testing with flaws subject to these kind of environments, pressure and combined loads can be used to validate the analytical models and guide the design process. There's also a whole team at CMS 17, the Composite Materials Handbook, really looking at learning how to improve this particular test. So it's basically a sandwich structure clamped at the bottom face sheet or bonded at the bottom face sheet. And all you do, you put in a flaw here and pulling that top face sheet out with a goal of really trying to measure that, that bond line face sheet to core interface, fracture toughness. The National Institute of Aviation Research also is doing testing, looking into that as well. And there's a lot of testing also being performed to characterize the cyclic behavior. So I have, the energy release rate, cyclic energy release rate. So I have I'm a loading and unloading, loading and unloading and so forth. And I'm characterizing the rate of delamination growth as a function of time. That's what this is right here.
Modeling wise, uh, one approach is to create a D-band model. Uh, axisymmetric model is one possibility. You put the core properties here, the phase sheet properties there, and you want to calculate basically for different pressures and compression nodes, you want to calculate the energy release rate. I wrote a paper for the American Society of Composites. I invite you to download it, and it's this one right here, right there, this paper. And in that paper, I provide closed form solutions that can be used in lieu of fine elements for pressure alone as a loading environment. And so this, these formulas can be used, um, basically I use energy principles for plate theory. I'm not gonna have you derive these equations. But bottom line, given the pressure, given the modulus, given the crack size and the thickness of the phase sheet, you can come up with omega naught. And once you calculate omega naught, you can plug it in here to this equation to get the energy release rate. This is meant to be a first order calculation. You definitely wanna do fine elements. Here's a 3D model, here's the axisymmetric model, and here's a close from solutions. You can apply it with the virtual crack pressure technique, which is a technique to uh, predict failure, basically. So continuing on, here is a close from solution uh, that you will get. So the way you will use this is, say you have a pressure level, I know the phase sheet thickness, and I know the critical energy release rate for that material. That will give me P prime. So say P prime came out to be about 10. And secondly, uh, I can calculate given omega naught. So what is omega naught? W naught divided by H. How much deflection do I have at this point divided by H? I can calculate that deflection. And once I have that, I can come here and figure out where along this curve I am, right? And given that information, I can find A prime. But in reality, this curve co covers everything. So once I have P prime, I can come here and that actually tells me how much it deflects compared to the thickness. It actually tells me that. Not only that, it tells me A prime, which is one in this case. And so then I can solve for AC because I know H, P, and E, and that'll give me the critical flaw size for the problem. One more time given the pressure, given the thickness, given the fracture toughness of the material, find P prime. Once you have P prime, say it's 0.1, I go up here, it hits about 11. I make A prime 11. I know H, the thickness of the plate, phase sheet, P the pressure inside the core, E the modulus, calculate AC. Once I have AC, I can tell you the critical flaw size, and I wanna make sure I design to not that critical flaw size, apply factor safety first, and then design to something that, to that flaw size. Here's the predictions of finite elements compared to the closed form solutions. It just shows that the closed form solution doesn't do too bad. And if you were to do 3D models versus axisymmetric models, this is 3D versus axisymmetric, which means you can revolve this 360. Obviously this is computationally more efficient. All they're showing here is that the 3D axisymmetric, 3D model and axisymmetric model do relatively well. It's a good approximation. You may have to account for heat in some problems. And here what I show you is a process that can help you do that. And it's based on the ideal gas law. Basically, you know, the temperature, uh, the in initial temperature, the initial volume, the final temperature and final volume, and you know the external pressure outside of the phase sheets, you know the internal pressure inside the phase sheet. So you can use uh, some calculations to determine, and here you can see correction for volume. So this correcting for volume inside there. So if the pressure's been applied, you have, you have a D bond, the pressure will pop out, the pressure will pop out the phase sheet, will increase it in volume as a balloon, and that's what this formula is doing here. Then you can calculate the energy release rate. And once you do that, you can then plug it in here to calculate the critical D-bond size. And I'll let you read the paper for more information. The effects of heating is that when temperature increases, it makes sense that if the temperature increases, the pressure increases. 
Therefore, you need smaller critical flaw sizes. If you increase the core height, it also results in critical flaw sizes. So considerations is that the closed form solution can help a lot, but you want to definitely do a model of this and making sure your non-destructive evaluation can find these flaws during the critical flaw size range. Because if I cannot find the flaw, that little beast, that little D band will continue to increase over time and you can get in trouble. So let me talk now about an approach of applying proof test methodology for reducing the risk of vented honeycomb core failure in aerospace structures. And I'll be demonstrating a methodology for accepting vented honeycomb designs, especially when you have weak bonds present between the core and phase sheet, which cannot, you cannot detect those very well with ultrasound or any of those geography or thermography. And the part of the reason is because they're just weak bonds. They're not completely broken bonds. And I'll demonstrate the approach for defining acceptable flaw size using this method. So you want to make sure your non-destructive evaluation can find these acceptable flaw sizes. And the approach that you need is you first have to define the loads. What are the external loads? What is the core pressure during ascent? The vent rate, the heating environment's altitude. And then you want to define acceptable flaw size using the building block approach, which I covered in part one of this course. But you want to characterize the phase sheet failure strength. You want to characterize the core to phase sheet interfacial fracture toughness, basically the fracture toughness between the two materials. You want to determine the strength of reduction due to environmental conditioning. You want to perform subsequent tests to validate your models are going to work with pressure load and combined external load. You, know, you want to validate through fracture and strength analysis the acceptable flaw sizes. So the proof test methodology involves developing non-destructive evaluation techniques to detect rapid, rapid detection to enable rapid detection of acceptable flaw sizes. We want to perform a proof test after that and a post proof in the E again, looking to see if the proof test did anything to the structure that will raise concerns. So for example, I have a one inch flaw inside and I apply a proof test. It's possible that one inch turns into one and a half. Well, that's something that needs to be looked for. That can be a problem. You can mitigate the risk of weak bond caused by failures uh, with no post proof in the this possibly this possible scenario where you don't have a no a post proof in the this possibility. Then you need to really look at other ways to mitigate that concern. So validate process controls via structural quality testing, implement and monitor process controls, verify as built strength via tag and test, and define credible damage threats and ensure the structure's adequate fatigue life to survive the loading environment per CMH 17. Here's a more comprehensive flow chart. I have the vehicle air loads, the max flight ascent loading conditions, pressure and temperature, maximum flight compression loads. And then I have phase sheet strength data and fracture test data. I'll plug that into a subscale model and test. So you want a, a little panel with pressure applied and you want to examine this box. You want to see if testing does a good job of matching analysis or analysis does a good job matching testing. Once I have that, I can determine the critical flaw size. Once I have the critical flaw size, I want to make sure I can develop an allowable flaw size. So there could be a factor of safety of two, for example. If the critical flaw size is three, and I know three is going to blow the whole face sheet apart, then perhaps I'll apply a factor of two and just select one and a half of what of, and that is, that is what you will allow, one and a half. Anything greater you try to repair. So then you, then you go into pre-proof NDE. Uh, so before you go to proof test, do a non-destructive evaluation. And if, and if uh, it's not acceptable, you have to repair it. Once you repair it, you go back and proof test it again. Do a post-proof NDE. And if there's flaws that grew or there's new flaws that showed up and they violate the acceptance criteria, go back and repair and repeat the process until you can accept the hardware. So clearly, uh, this is a method that has, that has a lot of merit um, and it's very powerful. Non-destructive evaluation techniques can be used like handheld ultrasonic inspection, geography, 
flash tomography, pulse echo, and air coupled transmission. Any of the select methods you select need to be good at finding these issues, right? Flash tomography is one that's pretty good. You can see here a picture of flash tomography clearly showing the, the, the flaw location. Coupon testing can also be performed. I talked about that, the single cantilever beam test, uh, apply a load and extract the energy release rate as a function of load to determine the fracture toughness. And that fracture toughness can later be used for failure prediction. Here's an example from one of my papers. You can see here that depending upon which direction you test, you can have GC to vary, G1C. But you can also see the coefficient variation is quite dramatic. So you have to basically bound the problem and, and, and you should be fine. And then here's a test where you're applying compression to the phase sheet and the core at the same time while pressurizing the core. That's a possibility as well. You can try to simulate flight conditions as much as you can if your flight, um, your flight documentation is not enough. You also have to consider the fact that hot and wet environmental exposure is important because if it's hot and wet, then the core pressure will increase at a higher rate than if it was dry and room temperature. Here's an example of a subscale test. You have here a launch vehicle design with some splices, uh, axial load and a bending mode, bending load. You can extract a little coupon from here, say, and then it has a D-bond and you pressure cycle it by applying pressure through this tube. You apply compression load with the objective of determining whether your models are good enough for doing these type of evaluations. Here's the re results. You can see here that most of the, so two of the failure modes for small defect size were phase sheet failures. The other two were phase sheet debond. But I recommend that you pause it and kind of look at this quickly. Um, it's very interesting data. Here there are six samples. Uh, the no defect one inch, two inch and three inch. You can see a three inch has a huge strength reduction compared to the no defect. Uh, the one inch is not too bad. Uh, there's one outlier here, 72%. That'll be interesting to see what happened there. And for the two inch defect, you're looking at a two thirds of the full capability. So that's why it's important. Anytime you use composites, try to understand what is the strength degree due to defects and the venting situation. And so you can create a final models for the one inch, two inch, three inch, and no flaw. And the idea there is to apply compression load and pressure inside to see how the behave, system behaves. You also wanna do a strain gauge correlation. So put a strain gauge at the top, a strain gauge at the bottom, run a test and see if um, it compares well to testing. And here I'll claim that that's pretty good. So again, the defects are always between the fish and the core, the ones we're worried about with this failure mode of concern. And this good correlation here, 5% model to test difference. So what are the failure modes? The fish you can pop out, fail, right? Not pop out, the fish you could fail locally and break the phase sheet completely. The second one is you have an unstable flood that propagates suddenly, right? Using this data and using the testing for the, from the single cantilever beam test, you can see that the testing is here in this column and that the modeling didn't do too bad. Uh, this is a model here, 0 0.93, 0 0.93 as a strength reduction, so 7% strength reduction, 7%, 93% strength of retention, 6, 0.65 here, 0 0.6, 0 0.42, 0 0.38 in the noise. I think this shows that I did a great job. The one inch defect failed due to phase failure, two inch and three inch due to phase sheet debond. How do you use that data now? The data is used very simply. You apply compression to the model, you look at, you apply internal pressure to the model in the core, and then you put debonds, one inch, two inch, three inch, and here we have all the data. So we're able to say, okay, we're gonna draw a line right here for the three inch, 
and I have the adjusted for environments. And I want my design to always fall in here. Plus, I want to have an NDE that's capable of finding these flaws as well. So in summary, what I've discussed is the approaches used in the aviation and aerospace industry uh, when it comes to unvented honeycomb designs. And it does require defects to be existing. Um, and here in this slide, what I've done is summarize all the key ingredients. You want to have a good NDE. You want to make sure that you have a proof test that verifies that workmanship. And that is of extreme importance. Pre and post proof NDI to make sure the Find out if the flag grew or not. And then use analysis to size your design to minimize that failure mode, to try to eliminate if you can. I also have some backup slides that, that are quite interesting. And I encourage you to look at that. Uh, you can play the video at half speed, but in essence, you have alerts, like big alerts in the composite adhesive newsletter saying, hey, stop, stop, stop. Vacuum conditions, adhesive bonded joints are better designed for intercell and panel venting, for example. Otherwise, quality escapes can result. That was 1999. Bonding, bug, bonding bugs delay X33 flight. Again, here you're talking about vented honeycomb failures. And the X33 program talks about the, all the issues associated with that because of the cost. And here's some historical precedents uh, that I already discussed a little bit. So feel free to pause it here and check it out. So yeah, this is a fair amount of concern that needs to be considered um, so thank you for listening and I hope you have a great day.